Menthol cigarettes uh, have a significant impact on the health of African Americans, contributing to heart attacks, uh, lung cancer, uh, strokes, and other diseases. Joining us right now uh, to uh, talk about uh, this, uh, bring my guests up, please, uh, folks. This is um, a, a really, a re really, really important story. Anybody knows I can't stand smoking, uh, and so. Um, uh, so again, I uh, want, want, want to bring up uh, the guest right now. Give me one second here. Uh, Mignon Guy, Chair of the Department of African American Studies at Virginia Commonwealth University uh, out of Richmond, Virginia. Uh, and um, uh, let's really break this thing down. People don't understand. There's a direct intersection of black-owned media and menthol cigarettes. Explain. Well, <laughs> Black-owned media and, and a multitude of other um, organizations as well. Unfortunately, the tobacco industry has done a great job in infiltrating Black communities in multitude of, of fashion. Um, they've inter infiltrated by early early on in the days they would advertise with um, you know ebony and jet and use ads of, of black images and try to portray a, a certain type of black culture that they wanted to sell to the public and um, and and it happened to work marketing works right and they brought this into our communities by infiltrating our media by infiltrating our 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 churches, our political organizations, such as Congressional Black Caucus, you name it. They've, they've done very well at spending but, their multi-billions of dollars trying to get into our community. But, but we have to add this, but we have to add this. And the reason that happened is because all of the other advertisers would not advertise in black media. So as a result, if you were Ebony, if you were Jet, if you were black newspapers, if you were black on radio, all these other companies would not advertise in black on media. And I dare say, and I know people may think this is crazy, without this advertising, a lot of black on media would have died. And that was the dilemma that black on media was in. And that is, damn, cigarettes, because you couldn't, because at, at, at that time, you couldn't do alcohol. So it's kind of like, look, they were coming there, and I, I remember full page ads in Ebony. That's right. Full That's page right. ads in Jet when other folks, car companies uh, and other brands would not touch black owned media. That's right. That's right. They, they exploited, they, I mean, they were very good at exploiting vulnerabilities in the black community, right? So if certain organizations didn't have funding or didn't have support, then in comes the industry and to save the day, right? But but the whole time, they're, they're actually peddling a poison to our communities. And I don't, it's really, I have such a push-pull sort of feeling about this because, you know, they've also done this with, with HBCUs. They've, they've funded HBCUs and given them them money and support because they don't get enough money from Congress or they don't get enough money for, for the from the federal government in order to survive and in order to serve our students the way that we need them to. So in comes the tobacco industry to come save the, the day, but it's, it's at too great of a cost. It's at a cost of 45,000 lives every year. And, and not only this, uh, who remembers, uh, uh, who remembers this uh, right here? Uh, that you see right here. Now, right. again, I, I need everybody to understand. When you hear the phrase cool jazz festival, you're thinking, oh, shit, this cool. No, 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 no. This is what they were advertising, the cool filters. Right. When, right. You, when you, Newport, same thing. You, yeah. you, th you think Newport Jazz Festival? You think, you think, oh, no, no. Newports. Uh, and not right. only that, when you go back to, again, go to the 70s, the Virginia Slims tennis tour. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That wasn't named after a slim woman named Virginia. <laughs> <laughs> no, it sure wasn't. It was and if, and then, product. But, but the product. And the last one, so, and, and again, I was talking African Americans, but um, um, you also had, why is it escaping me right now, for the long, oh, uh, the Winston Cup in NASCAR. 
Yeah. The Winston, what no man named Winston, that was a cigarette brand. So the cigarette companies, they were massive spenders of advertising, and that didn't really end until you had those state, those state lawsuits where they began to lose those, and part of the agreement when those lawsuits, they had to stop advertising. That's right. That's right. And you know, it's funny you mentioned that because not only did they did they did they infiltrate black communities by media, right? We I live in Richmond, Virginia right now. I'm a new transplant to to, to the Confederacy as I call it. On our camp I live in Richmond, Virginia. It's a predominantly black area. And you walk onto our campus and what do you see is the Altria Theater, which is owned by Philip Morris, right? So they have their they have their way of going into these communities in multiple ways. And I've done other shows recently, and and folks would call in and they would talk about how um, the only people that could get the only decent jobs that that black folks could get in some some of the tobacco regions was with the tobacco industry. And so they would give them well-paying jobs, and they would they would give them security where they couldn't get jobs in other places. And what happened? They gave them free cigarettes to take home and to give to their families and to give to their friends. So so they had media, and they still have media. They just do digital media now, right? Because they can't do the billboards anymore. So they had the media cornered. They they came into the communities by by giving churches funding, and they would they would support certain types of um, you know, gatherings and things of that nature, those festivals that you referred to, which was perfect, married it with, with music. So it seemed okay. And it seemed like it was part of the culture. And then they gave them jobs and, and they still do it today. They still try to recruit black uh, scientists to come over to, to the industry to try to work for them as well. Uh, again, and again, it's just one of those things people really don't understand how deep uh, this went, Steve. And, and then when you talk about those events, it was literally buying tables at every black event, black conferences. Uh, I mean, it was uh, extremely uh, deep uh, in the black community. Uh, questions from my panel, uh, Candace, you first. So we've been talking about this push and pull. As you said, they provided money to media companies and they provide jobs. But I've been reading about this push and pull, too, in terms of black clergy, black clergy and store owners saying, hey, listen, you can't just get rid of these menthol uh, cigarettes because people are going to find other ways around it and you're going to be taking away business from us. So I'm wondering, what's your response to that for people saying this is going to hurt us economically we have to do something else because prohibition is never going to work. Didn't work with alcohol. Didn't work with abortion. Hasn't worked with a lot of stuff. So, uh, so before uh, before she answers that, uh, I'm gonna tell you something. So, and again, people need to understand how they buy off people. And let me be perfectly clear: uh, the ads that you see running for this campaign, we're being paid to run those ads. I got no problem saying that. But I despise cigarettes. I'm allergic to smoke. So. I would say ban all that shit. I'm perfectly fine with it. But here's, <laughs> but here's what I, I, I need people to understand. It was a few years ago. So you got two black chambers. You got the Black Chamber of Commerce that Harry Alford uh, 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 runs, okay? And they always paying them to do stuff. I'm being straight up. Then you got US Black Chambers, Inc. So a few years ago when this issue came up, all of a sudden we see these news releases and Alford's group was saying, oh no, we, you know, we can't support this because this is gonna hurt the black-owned convenience stores. That was what they were using. I got an email last year from uh, a black political operative who you see on television on one of the networks trying to stop the ban, the FDA ban on menthols. And they pulled in some prominent black pastors and black lawyers. So they were trying to book them on my show. And I was like, hell no, that shit ain't happening. And then of course, Politico, Politico later did a story on the black civil rights and folks and lawyers who were being paid off. They were trying to use that very argument, uh, Candace, oh, this gonna hurt the black convenience stores. Until you start trying to add up, how many black convenience stores do you actually have that are being impacted. They're like, oh, it's gonna hurt the black-owned bodegas in New York. 
Yeah. Who? Yeah. So they, they so they've tried to use, I mean, uh, the economic, oh, you, you're going to hurt black people when, hold up, how many people die per year? 45,000 lives per year. That's, yes. That's black lives or total lives? 45,000 black lives. So 45,000 black lives. Mm -hmm. And we ain't talking the untold millions we got to spend on health care as a result of this. And menthol cigarettes are a lot different than other cigarettes, correct? Yes. Yes, they're absolutely different. So menthol cigarettes actually are more addictive. Menthol cigarette smokers tend to have more nicotinic receptors in their brains, right? And so it makes it more difficult for them to quit. The smoking topography is different. How you inhale the products are different because they have the coolants and they have the sugars in them that makes the poison go down more smoothly. Mm. That's why, and the reason why they have these coolants in there Excuse me. One of the one of the the appeals of of the menthol cigarettes are the coolants, which make them more appealing to young people, to young kids. We have black kids who are age 12, between 12 and 18, that use these products, and we also have white children that start using these products earlier because it makes the poison go down more smoothly. Not only do they increase the nicotinic receptors, they make them more addictive. They make them more difficult to quit smoking. That's why we have such low rates of quitting amongst black people. And I will get back to that, the, the store owner thing. We don't, we don't have, when we go to these neighborhoods, let's look at the, who owns the stores in the neighborhoods. They're usually not black people, quite frankly. Mm -hmm. we, don't, we don't own the things that we need to be owning in our own communities. We often see other groups and other populations that own these products. So the economic impact on the stores compared to the devastating economic impact on the lives that we're losing it's, it's just, it's a no-brainer. You know what I'm saying? We're talking about potentially 37% of the menthol, excuse me, 37% of this uh, the cigarette market is menthol cigarettes. 85% of the people who smoke menthol are black people. Mm -hmm. Those are the, those are the And 94% of black youth who smoke, smoke menthol. Mm. Boom. Mm. <laughs> exactly. It's those, those arguments that we hear the arguments about store ownership, about the economic impact, which which doesn't match the, the, the cost associated with health care that we have, right? The arguments that we hear about they're the same people that, that, that Roland Martin is speaking about, those I, I guess I can't say their names on TV, but, but these political mm -hmm. leaders, these high profile leaders will say mm -hmm. things like, well, black people deserve to, to they, they have the right to choose what they want to smoke and what they want to do. They're not accounting for those 90% of the youth that, that Roland referred to. They're not accounting for the exposure to youth that buy secondhand smoke because black populations unfortunately have the high the lowest rates of in-home smoking bans. So when we have children that are exposed to these products, they also have nicotinic receptors that are that are producing in their brains and so they're more likely to smoke. And let's talk about let's not miss mm. the fact that the highest the high, what, what do we have in terms of mortality for children, black children in particular? It's asthma, right? We have asthma issues. Those kids are exposed right. to this smoke, and therefore they have higher rates of hospitalization and death associated with their exacerbated asthma that is complicated by this menthol cigarette smoking. Uh, and uh, I remember when we first started this show, again, I need everybody watching to understand, we first started Roller Martin Unfiltered, we had one advertiser, uh, the American Federation of State County Municipal Employees, thanks to my frat brother, Lee Saunders. Do you know who all of a sudden wanted to advertise with us? Jewel. Ooh. Not, not, not Jewel Osco Grocers, not a jewelry store. Jewel, uh, they had the, uh, the flavored uh, vapes, correct? That's right. Mm -hmm. They have flavored, so flavored they, vapes. So they, they came to us uh, and was trying to throw some serious money and my response was, y'all can kiss my ass. Thank you. Because you know what? Other people did not. There are, who will remain nameless, there is at least one HBCU that took $7.5 million um, of money from Juul in order to mm. study Juul in black populations before black people were actually using that product. Do you think that they were doing that for the good of the community? Wow. Larry, yeah. your question. 
Yeah, so we essentially have, based on this conversation in our research, is intersection of public health and capitalism, <laughs> right? Racial, so, racial, uh, racial capitalism, racial capitalism, racial, right? Racial capitalism. Yeah, let's be clear about that. So, mm -hmm. and, and on top of that, it's during a time of anti-blackness. <laughs> so all these black people are dying. We're talking about the, how much money it costs, obviously, health care and also the counters, as Roland talked about in terms of, you know, what it costs black entrepreneurs. And so I was curious in terms of what you think the argument is, considering capital, black, you know, racial capitalism, public health, and anti-blackness, what is the argument you make to policymakers about why this is why this is an important issue? The fact that the fact that menthol is in our in our neighborhoods. Let's let's make it very clear. The tobacco industry, as I'm a chair of Black Studies, right? The tobacco industry was 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 studying black communities. Thank you for showing this. The, the tobacco industry was was studying black communities before my discipline even existed. They were looking at the woes and the the, the lack of civil rights and and all of the oppression that was happening in these communities. They used redlining, these racist tactics in order, this, these vestiges of racist taxes that, act, that actually continue into the present with residential segregation, they use these racial, racist um, maps that the federal government gave them in order to target black communities and sell these products. And, and somehow it's now been contorted and distorted to think that somehow menthol is naturally part of the black community. No, this was a concerted effort, right? So my argument to these individuals is that this is, to take this out of our communities, this is reparations. Because what they've done is they created the roadmap for for them to for these products to go into our neighborhoods. They refused in the Family Smoking Prevention Act, Tobacco Control Act of 2009. They refused to ban menthol. They banned every other uh, flavored uh, cigarette, like cherry and and you know all kinds of other cloves and things like that. Things that people didn't even use. They refused to. They 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 banned all of these because these are what white kids might use. And they kept menthol on the market, which was 85% of the black population that was using using them. So, so my argument is, this is reparations. My argument is, this is a chance to clean up this poison and this drug that you have uh, permitted this industry to infiltrate into our communities. So before I go uh, to Joe's question, this is a political story from last year. And again, here was the new argument they tried last year, okay? They tried last year to say, oh, that this is going to lead to over-policing of black communities. And so uh, this, is, th th this was, Jul this was uh, April 28, 2002, too. So concerns about over-policing threaten to stall a ban on menthol cigarettes and undermine the major tobacco regulation a decade in the making. And so you literally had uh, CBC members uh, you had, the article says here, Reverend Al Sharpton, civil rights attorney Ben Crump, and relatives of George Floyd right. have argued that the rules should they, they can take effect would give law enforcement another reason to target black people. Uh, I mean, you literally had this, uh, it, this, this was in their story. Then, uh, there were, this story says members of the Congressional Black Caucus are divided, but an aid to the group said that the push from civil rights leaders over recent weeks has caused members to give greater thought to what could be potential unintended consequences. Uh, and so, uh, so uh, Donald uh, McEachin, who actually who's passed away, uh, he was quoted here as well. And so again, w what you had here was different arguments being targeted. The goal was not to deal with over-policing. The goal was not to deal with anything else. The goal was to keep black people buying menthol cigarettes. Joe. There is so much to know and to learn about this. I, I like to think I'm somebody that pays attention to the issue but this has been very educational for me. So tell me how, you know, because we have to do so much, you know, when there's the job arguments, you've got to have the counter to that. Where are our jobs going to come from? When there's the over-policing right. arguments, we've got to have our counters to that. There's so many, this is a multi-front war. How do you feel that it's going in terms of educating people? Do you feel like we're making progress or do you feel like you're beating your head against the wall? 
Depends on the day. <laughs> um, I think that having having platforms such as this is really important. It's critically important. Um, being able to most of the arguments that have been presented today um, and the ones that were in the news, such as the hyper policing and over policing in black and brown communities, which is another topic. And I do um, want to make sure that uh, that I acknowledge the fact that um, police brutality and hyper-policing and over-policing is, is a, an issue. I, if I could have a moment just to clear it up to your audience, because I really want to address this. This ban is potentially, the, the excuse me, the potential ban, because I'm not even sure that they'll even do right by us and actually do what they should and ban it. The ban is at the manufacturer's level. It is at the manufacturer, the wholesaler, the distributor, and the retailer. It is not at the individual unit of analysis. It is not for a black person that if they happen to get a menthol cigarette somehow that is smoking it, that they, that has no effect on them, right? So, so the argument of policing is, is a little bit problematic simply because of the fact that the ban is at the industry and those who are selling it not at the people who may have get you know get their hands on it right that's the first thing that i wanted to say the second thing is is that i'm i'm concerned about the thought that we we can't do both how come you know we can we want to talk about save black lives against police brutality but we don't want to save black lungs when it comes to cigarettes and and cancer and every other disease actually cuz menthol act cigarettes actually affect every organ in the body and we know that, that black people have more comorbidities than anyone else, right? So we can't save both lives in both cases. You know what I'm saying? Does it have to be an and or? Can it be a both and? Can we, can we actually deal with corrupt policing and racist police officers that do exist? And can we also save the lives that, that, of children and, and adults that use, the, that use these products, that are addicted to these products, that we don't even have good evidence-based practices to help them quit? Right. So it's not like people people always want to say to me, well, Mignon, if people want to quit smoking menthol cigarettes, they'll just quit. No, menthol cigarettes are much harder to quit. Right. Right. That's another reason why we have to ban this product. It should not be on the market because we don't even have decent evidence based practices in order to help people quit appropriately. Um, I'm going to read this and I'm going to get a final comment uh, because this because this this, this was the political story y'all last year. And we in uh, Mignon addressed it earlier. A 2021 study found that although black Americans make up 12 percent of the population, 13 percent, they incurred 41 percent of all deaths and 50 percent of the years of life lost due to menthol cigarettes between 1980 and 2018. Well, let me say that again. Mm. We make up 12 to 13% of the population, but of the people who die with, to menthol cigarettes, we make up 41% of the deaths and 50% of the years of life lost. Years of life lost means income lost, family time lost. That has a direct impact on our ability to create wealth. That actually makes it even more economically difficult on our families because we're dying younger. And while we are then dying because of that, we're incurring higher medical costs, putting our folks in more economic danger as well. So right. folks need to understand that Candace asked the point earlier, she went in her question, uh, and isn't it correct? Because again, for the people who say, because I think she, she asked, people are gonna say, oh, they, they can always get this here. There was a dramatic decrease when those lawsuits were successful when it came to folks smoking. And the reality is the tobacco industry, the reason they went to the vapes and the flavored uh, stuff because people actually stopped smoking when the bans went into effect, correct? That's right. That's right. That's right. And we also see in, in Canada, Canada has already banned menthol cigarettes. Other countries have banned menthol cigarettes. You know, we, we are holding on to it because we have 37, menthol cigarettes are 37% of the market, 85% of the black people who smoke, smoke menthol. It's, we're throwaways in this country. Boom. Right? 
we're throwaways in this country. They left us on the table in 2009, and they'll, and if, if, if we give them the opportunity, they'll leave us on the table again, right? And yes, people will quit. When you look at, when you talk to smokers, I'm, I study tobacco. When you speak, and I'm a former smoker, see, so I can even speak from that, from that viewpoint, that vantage point. When you Ooh, speak Lord, smokers, thank God you're a former smoker, because uh, we couldn't get along if you were smoking. I'm going to go ahead. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, but hey, come on, it's a folly of youth. So, but, but when you speak to smokers, the vast majority of people who smoke want to quit. They want to quit, right? So we're not talking about, some, about imposing something on them that they don't already want. The vast majority want to quit. It's very difficult. It's very hard. It's harder to quit smoking cigarettes than it is to quit heroin. This is a fact. So when we're talking about this, we really need to understand that we that that what we do with this with this potential ban because I'm not convinced it's going to happen. I've never, sorry, I'm not speaking. I you know I do work on the FDA's uh, tobacco scientific advisory board, so I'm telling you in advance I'm not speaking on behalf of the FDA. I'm speaking on behalf of on behalf of Mignon Guy, a black woman who lives in America, and I have very rarely seen the federal government do right by black people, which is why I call this reparations because this is a time for them to get it right. And you know, one more thing I want to I want to say to you before we wrap up. One thing that we have to be really cognizant of is there's a, there's so much counter market there's so much um, misinformation and disinformation that the industry is putting out right now. And a lot of the arguments that we're talking about are exactly those arguments. There's when you get on the FDA calls to listen to comments, you hear people that 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 it's on the phone so you can't see what they look like but you hear them say well i'm a i'm a i'm a black police officer in this neighborhood or i'm a white police officer in this neighborhood and i'm worried that that if we ban menthol then then the, we'll have more policing in black neighborhoods when have you ever heard a police officer say that they are worried about hyper policing police brutality and over policing in black neighborhoods these people are being paid these people are being paid. And the industry has, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. They have a lot of money to yep. pay these people, Yep. right? We already know that they paid black people in, in California to, to vote against, to, to go protest against the ban that they, thank God, got through in California. Yep. But there was already an ad out that, that showed that they were getting paid $80 an hour for two and a half hours of work to get black people, black people to come out with T-shirts, almost looking like the ones that, that were like, Blacks vote for Trump, right? To ban, to vote against, to vote, uh, to to vote against the 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 ban on menthol. So they're taking our own people to vote against our own interests to save our own black lungs and to save our own black lives. Yep. We cannot allow this to happen. Uh, we absolutely cannot allow this to happen. Uh, and again, I just need people to understand. They wanted to pay me a lot of money to advertise Jewel on this show. And I said no. And I need, and so, so to our audience, when I'm talking about we're fighting these advertising battles, when I'm talking about when, when I'm asking you to contribute and give, do understand why, it's because there are folks who want to come to us uh, and yes, these, these tobacco companies. And for me on principle, it's an absolute no, period. But guess what? If we don't have this show, we can't counter the messaging. And so you have to understand, and that's, that was the trick that they used against Black-owned media in the 70s, in the 80s, in the 90s. And I'm talking about they had 26 and 52-week ad buys for newspapers which is unheard of, and they had 12-month ad buys in magazines when no other major advertisers were willing to give them the kind of money. So just understand what uh, Professor Guy is laying out. It was a clear, it was a clear play on Jim Crow racist policies, filling the void, knowing full well we needed the money, but what it also did was it gave them and inroad into our lungs and our households. And we are paying the price. Professor Guy, we appreciate it. Thank you so very much. Look forward to having you back. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And thank you for not, for keeping the good fight. Thanks so much. Can All right, folks, back to our Gold Mark Unfiltered video in just one moment.
For decades, the tobacco industry has deliberately targeted black communities and kids with marketing for menthol cigarettes. It's had a devastating impact on black health. Tobacco use claims 45,000 black lives every year. It's the number one cause of preventable death. In the 1950s, less than 10% of black smokers used menthol cigarettes. Today, it's 85%. Ban menthol cigarettes. Save lives. When you talk about blackness and what happens in black culture, we're about covering these things that matter to us, uh, speaking to our issues and concerns. This is a genuine people-powered movement. There's a lot of stuff that we're not getting. You get it, and you spread the word. We wish to plead our own cause too long have others spoken for us. We cannot tell our own story if we can't pay for it. This is about uh, covering us. Invest in Black-owned media. Your dollars matter. We don't have to keep asking them to cover our stuff. So please support us in what we do, folks. We want to hit 2,000 people, $50 this month, raise $100,000. We're behind 100000 so we want to hit that. Y'all money makes this possible. Check some money orders. Go to P.O. Box 57196, Washington, D.C., 20037- 0196. The cash app is dollar sign RM Unfiltered. PayPal is R Martin Unfiltered. Venmo is RM Unfiltered. Zelle is rolling at rollingsmartin.com. 